Good morning. Uh, welcome to our panel on building the dream team. Uh, we'll aim to perfect. We'll aim to cover the uh, the various aspects of uh, what a music artist can hope to develop during their career, uh, and hopefully give some some tips on uh, how they can take the next steps for that. So today we have some fantastic people. Uh, I've, I've had the pleasure of getting to know just over the last 24 hours. Uh, all areas of the industry. Um, uh, we've got Mark, Anita, Grace, and Ben. Uh, let's hear from each of them about who they are and what they do. Uh, let's start with Ben. I start. Uh, hello, I'm Ben. Um, I work for FKP Scorpio. Um, I promote, I book shows and uh, tours of mainly international artists in Germany. I've been in the industry for 15 years now. Um, did all kinds of uh, internships, apprenticeships, uh, assistant roles, so it's been a long way. Um, I work on my own roster now for six years. I uh, present artists like Fontaine CC, Nick Cave, Jungle in Germany. Yeah, that's what I do. Hello, everybody. So I'm Grace. Uh, and I run my own company called Three Notes, which was primarily a management company and then converted into offering lots of different services, both to artists, labels, export offices, conferences, and another hat that I wear, you, some of you that came to the presentation yesterday, is working for the project Live MX. And the third of the hats is I actually teach also at Berkeley Valencia, different courses spanning from publishing, artists as a startup, and brands and partnerships. Hello, my name's Mark Garfield. I am co-director of Pop-Up Music in London. Uh, we're based at the famous Rack Studios, uh, where we also represent the Rack Catalogue, which is a vintage catalogue from the 70s, which was uh, produced by Mickey Most, lots of hits like I Love Rock and Roll. And then Pop-Up has its own catalogue, which is a one-stop catalogue of, again, a lot of vintage stuff from the 1920s right up to today. Um, and uh, I suppose our biggest uh, sync to date is with Quentin Tarantino's last movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So we had uh, three tracks in that. Morning, my name is Eneida Fieber, I'm from Barcelona. I've been in the music business for about, I think, all my life, basically. I've been doing a bit of everything. But what I do now is I'm a PR agent, which basically I'm the link between the artist and, and the press. So I make, I make sure I try to <laughs> make that the music from the artist gets a play on the radio or get interviews. So I, I work directly with artists and I work with uh, promoters, manager and record labels. So basically I'm just the, the link between that, trying to make the music to be <laughs> everywhere. Thank you, um, and I'm Sam. Uh, I run my own one-stop publisher and record label, Pretty Decent Music. Uh, I've been a writer, uh, a music composer, uh, and I also make sheet music. Now, um, we've probably heard lots of different things. Uh, quick poll from the audience. Is there anything you've heard so far that you haven't understood? Is there one thing that someone said that you haven't quite grasped? Uh, show of hands? Nothing, okay, well, everyone knows everything. Excellent, we don't need to talk anymore. Um, <laughs> um, but there are lots of, lots of aspects to uh, the music industry. So for a, a beginner in the industry, how can they understand what's important to them? How can they grasp that? Uh, Grace? Can I jump on this one? Absolutely. So I always say when you're really starting out, the first thing is to analyze what are you making? You know, ask all the how, what, why, and when questions. It's to think, where am I in my career? What music do I have? What are my objectives? And then sort of based on those objectives and also understanding your strengths and weaknesses, this will all help you identify if you need somebody to help you along the way and build that potential team. So yeah, starting now, it's answer all the questions. Brainstorm. Mark? Uh, yeah, I think to sort of add on to what Grace is saying is if you can sort of get a grip on every aspect early on, so you become your own manager, you become your own booking agent, you become your own publisher, so you understand publishing, you understand everything. And then when that gets to a point where you're too busy and you're getting too much going on, then you can 
start to employ people, but if you have that bit of knowledge beforehand about what each aspect of the, the game is, then that will give you uh, a good head start on picking the right team to, to put around you. Yeah, I think it's important to meet people, to compare um, to each uh, like yourself with each other, to profit from uh, somebody else's experience, from mistakes other people made. Um, yeah, I think it's all about creating a network in the end. I also think it's important for the artists that although it's entertainment, it, that doesn't mean that um, I think you have to be professional as well. I mean, you have to be careful about the photos you you show, your social network. So you have to be a professional as well. Although, as I said, people do the music because it's fun and they want to play in a band, but it's also a job. So I think you have to take things seriously as well. That's important. Absolutely. Uh, Mark, you mentioned self-managing. Um, that's something that every artist has to start doing immediately. Uh, they already have so much that they have to do, social media, uh, learning the music, uh, figuring out gigs, figuring out you know how to write, where to record. Um, is it really feasible for them to be self-managing? I think so. I mean, I think to the point where even people like Mick Jagger looks after his own finance and he's a finance expert and a tax expert. So, you know, you can be at that level and you can still have a grip on part of your empire of what's going on. So I think the more control or more, as I said just now, the more understanding that you have, uh, obviously, when it gets to the point where you can't be booking your own tours because you're too busy doing the, the tour yourself, then you might need to employ someone like Ben to book your gigs, someone you know, to look after your PR and, and all the rest of it. But yeah, if you can have a good understanding of it, then you can kind of have an eye on things, let's say that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, uh, Grace? No, I was just gonna add on to what Mark was saying there. I think it really is key that you learn to do everything yourself first, because then that, that's the only way you're going to learn what are you actually good at and what do you absolutely hate doing. You know, you mm. may hate booking gigs, so and you can't network and you you don't look for the right opportunities. So maybe you do need somebody to give you a helping hand there, or you may just be traumatized by social media, and you may need somebody to manage all your digital. But the key is to start from somewhere and start doing it all yourself and learning as you go. Yeah, and I think gone are the days where you kind of just go, well, I'm going to be a rock star. I'm going to let everyone take care of all of that. You know, th when I started out, that was my attitude. <laughs> Look at me now. <laughs> I'm, I'm a drummer, by the way, and I was in bands a million years ago. But uh, at that point, I was like, I don't want anything to do about publishing and you know booking gigs. You know, I'm just going to play the drums. And that was my attitude. And I think today, you want to have your your head into all of it and an understanding of all, all the aspects of the business. Um, I, I think what Mark said, I think it's also really important to be an observer, uh, observe, you know, to see what other people do, the bands that you admire or you like, or they're similar or what you do. Just just keep an eye on what they do, which are the things that, in which media they are, um, how they use their social. So I think it's important to be an observer. And also I think it's really, really important to be a part of your local scene. You have to go to gigs, meet other musicians, meet professionals. So it's, um, I, I really highly recommend just to go out and be seen and see and observe. I think that's very important. Not just be behind your computer or just making music on your own at home. Leave the house, absolutely. Exactly. Leave yeah. the house. Um, from a booking perspective, um, for people to be self-managing and, and looking for their own gigs, how easy is that? What, can they, what tips would you give them to, to finding those first gigs? Well, I think that's where I have to be honest in terms of um, I get sent so many suggestions, so many bands approach me um, with their hot new project. Um, I have to be honest in a way that uh, the chances are higher at a, a level where you actually have a management uh, for me to, to book them. Um, but of course, you have to get to that level. So. Um, I mean, I can just underline what you just said. Um, be present um, on and offline. Um, go out, um, create a network. People will see you. So what can new artists do to present themselves in a way that would be more attractive to you as a booking agent? What can they do? Um, what, do you, what do you look for in particular? 
I mean, for example, uh, there's more and more bands that bring a, a photo, a film uh, person with them on tour. It's, it's good to um, see what they do, to um, have them create an atmosphere where you can, can, can grasp what, what, what's happening on stage. So that might be an investment in the first place, but it has, has such a good turnout. So yeah, it's important for me to see what's happening. Grace? Yeah, I think as well, just to, to add on what Ben was mentioning there, whenever I have pers personally an artist approach me that either wants support on their project, consulting, managing, what we want to see is almost get the goosebumps by email in a way, you know? We want to see that live video and know what we will experience if we came to your show. So I, I always harp on, if you have a limited budget and you have to decide between doing a music video or record a live video, I would always go for the live video because that's going to show us what will your concert will look like. Don't send too many links. Don't send too long an email. Just be concise, clear, and make yourself stand out and, and build your brand in that email. And that's also so important when, um, I mean, my job these days is to pitch for uh, bands for festivals. and. Um, as you can imagine, there's just too many bands for too few festivals. And I mean, having live footage, having an atmosphere created, that's the most important thing. Sounds, yeah, absolutely. Um, going back to uh, um, the music itself, uh, people talk about sync, people talk about placements, opportunities, and things like that. Uh, Mark, how do you scrutinize what comes to you and uh, what are you looking for? Well. We at Pop Up, we look at a song's syncability when stuff comes to us. So we're really looking at it from a, a sync point of view. Um, so what does that mean? We, my partner, Jim, and I, we have what we call the sync mangle, which is where we put the song in the top and then we grind it through and get and see what comes out of the bottom. And we go, OK, this lyric would be great for a TV drama or this lyric would be really good for an indie film or this is really great for gaming. So there's many aspects to sync, but sort of to relate sync to what we're talking about today um, in terms of creating your perfect team, if you do get a really good sync agent then you can get a really good sync placement, then that can mean that you might get a hit on a TV show in a certain territory, let's say, and then that might give you the opportunity then to go and tour and play some gigs in, in that city. So you might end up in a, a film in Mexico, uh, and it's a massive hit. Hello, do you want to join in? Uh, no, you're right. No. <laughs> um, yeah, she's just got a sync. Congratulations. <laughs> so yeah, you have a hit, a hit in the, in a film in Mexico, and uh, that could provide enough traction to then uh, give yourself some gigs. I think uh, working in the industry, you talk about sync aspirationally. Every, everyone uh, thinks their music is going to work in sync, but realistically, what are the chances? It depends on the project. You know, it, everyone says their music's great for sync, but it's only great if it's great for that particular project. So understanding who you're who you're speaking with, I guess that's very crucial. Yeah, I mean, knocking on the right doors, as I call it. So you know, if you're if you're uh, your music is a, a certain type of style and you've seen it perhaps in a director's taste and you've seen it in previous movies, then maybe track down who the music supervisor is or who the publisher or who the sync agent is providing that music to that director. So to try and knock on the right doors to, to, to get yourself in, in the right pos position. So we've just mentioned the music supervisors, uh, uh, direct film directors, Film directors, um, and producers. Music, producers, music publishers as well. So how can they find out about all of these people? Where could they where Well, they, they come to things like this, which is a really good start. Um, and there's actually two sync panels later on. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> More to learn. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I think 70% uh, of success is turning up, right? So if you're turning up to something like this and you're getting the knowledge, obviously you can get knowledge online. But, you know, simple things like IDBM, looking, looking at credits on movies and, and stuff like this. Doing research and reaching out yeah. to people. Just watch a lot of telly. <laughs> uh, and Anita, when, um, when it comes to, uh, to what you do, 
uh, in fact. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on, on PR and what that really means. Um, uh, when your inbox is flooded, uh, what stands out? What are you looking for? Well, something that Grace mentioned before is like um, the email has to be short and precise, not long emails. And also what I really recommend in bands is not to send a link that takes you to another link to another link. So it takes you five links to listen to the music. So I think it has to be easy for us because we receive thousands of emails every day. So it has to be something that gra grabs, to grab my attention is something precise, short, and easy. And that's so something that also Grace mentioned is like a live video is super, super important because you see re really when a band can really defend the project. So that thing that's, that's, that's interesting. And also, obviously, you have to be a nice person because I've been working with some artists that they make really great music, but they are absolutely annoying. So <laughs> I prefer not to do that. <laughs> yeah, I get, sorry. I get so many emails um, that are not like individualized. You know, same text, just uh, my name in another copy paste. Uh, yeah, in another uh, um, color, another font, just my name, copy pasted in. Um, take your time to personalize. Personalize quality before quantity. Totally, it's much better to do your research and send ten emails, fully personalized, than do a mass mail into a hundred cold calling. You know, and if you start the personalization with a comment, just like. If I'm writing to Mark, for example, I said, oh, great job on that sync, Mark, that you've just announced on socials. So already you're creating a relationship. And something that really, really, really annoys me, and I always want to say on these panels, is have patience. The amount of emails that I get and say, We'd, I'd love to talk next week. Well, you don't know my agenda. And then you get a message on LinkedIn. And then you get a message on Instagram from the same person. That's stalking, okay? <laughs> so, so be really careful when you're reaching out and show a lot of patience and respect for the, for the people. It's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> yeah, also flattery. I mean, you're right, Grace. If you've done your research and you write to someone, you say, hey, that was really cool what you did in that movie or that last tour you did, really loved the band. And you know, that, that opening song, was just really cool and I thought it was a great set list. Just something where they, that person you're writing to feels like, oh, actually this person's taking the time out to show interest. Uh, and with emailing, you can get to everybody these days all over the world. Uh, we were talking earlier about uh, building your local audience and, and knowing your, your neighborhood, your people close to you. Um, when you're emailing, when you're reaching out, should, should people be looking abroad or locally? I mean, where should they be looking for their support? I think you have to start from, from zero, no? I mean, there's different steps, no? so I think first you have to understand where you are, where you live, and what other bands do in your local scene. So before thinking big, you have to think small. So I think you have to step at a time. I think you, be, you have to create your own scene, be part of the scene, and understand also your market before thinking bigger. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, it doesn't mean that there are aren't any exceptions. I mean, I, I remember we, uh, uh, us promoting a, a Norwegian band uh, with a beautiful name, Kak Marafaka. <laughs> They're big in Spain, actually. Yes, ah. um, they were totally unknown in Norway and um, pulled 1,500 tickets in Germany. I think They're that was... Big, yeah, yeah, in Spain, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I think that was because... Um, they had a, a competitive advantage in terms of they had three background dancers, male background dancers, um, funky indie pop uh, back 10 years. Um, that was what was hot back then. Um, and uh, some German festivals uh, found them by accident, um, had them on, and that's how they became big in Germany without anyone in Norway knowing them. So that is an exception, but I totally agree in terms of uh, know your local market, um, build your local audience, which gives, also gives me an impression of um, that it can work. And uh, with um, music from different areas, from different countries, even if they're, they're, they're more um, generic and, and not specific to the country, how does it work with sync? How, what are you looking for if you, if you hear it from a, a German band doing American covers? Does that make any difference? 
I mean, American, uh, sort of German Americana is an interesting thing, or or Italian Americana is happening, and um, you know, sort of globalization of music is quite surprising that each country has their own version of all the different genres. Of course, they do. Speaking to the guy of Spotify last night, and uh, he was saying, you know, talking about localization, about different markets, and about how different charts in in, in each territory just really reflect what's going on there. But, you know, they, you know, Italy's probably got their own grime artist, but, you know, they're not from London. They're, you know, they're from, from Rome or somewhere. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it, it is really localized, but, but it's really global at the same time. So how can those uh, local artists reach abroad? I mean, who, what should they be, how should they be presenting themselves? So I always say the first step is to understand where the actual opportunities are. So look at your stats, who's listening to your music. If your home territory is here, but maybe your second country is France, third, Germany, then sort of that's already an indicator that there are people that like your music in those countries. So that's a good place to start. It's then do your research and look who's working in that industry, who would be potentially interested in supporting you, like if you wanted to connect in, in Germany and you had enough potential to present yourself, for example, to somebody like Ben. Um, so that would be the first step. Identify the key markets and then build a plan based on that. But not just a go in, go out. You know, you've got to really build a strategy and say, okay, over the next year, my aim is to go and tour in Germany. How do I do that? I need to research maybe PR that can build interest in my profile. And there's a long story that you've got to build there. And it doesn't just end when you, you're on the last day of the tour. You want to carry on and you want to grow and you want to build on these opportunities that you're creating. So you always say, first step, know where your audience is. And just going back to basics, when you're going on tour, before you go on tour, of course, you have to have music. Uh, prepared. Maybe that's your music that you've written or recorded, yeah. most likely recorded, maybe released. There's a whole talk in that, I'm sure, as well. Um, people are told of all these organizations like PRS and Gamer and ASCAP and PPL and the MU and lots of other organizations in, in every single country. How can a, a new artist um, hope to learn about that and uh, what should they look out for? Are these compulsory organizations? Which ones should they join? Well, in terms of PROs, it is good to join a PRO, so whatever country you're in, and but you don't have to join your own countries. You, know, you can join BMI in the States or, or whatever it want, you, know, you want, really. Um, but what, what is a PRO, just for anyone who doesn't know? Yeah, so a PRO is a collection society, so they're collecting royalties. Um, so royalties can be uh, from your live shows, and it can be also from syncs, from, from TV, it can be from radio and broadcast, so many aspects, but essentially it's, it's a collection society, so they go in and collect money for you. So it's, it's a very handy thing to have. And also, just while we're on that, registrations and just making sure that everything's correct is very, very important. But that's another panel. <laughs> Spreadsheets. Q sheets. Q sheets. Uh, ben, <laughs> I mean, in, in from, from a touring perspective, Q sheets, are they important? I mean, in terms of life, um, try to apply for support from your local export office. I mean, um, touring internationally or starting to tour internationally means losing money in the first place, most of the times, 90% of the cases. So uh, you'll probably need the support. And it's important to, to make sure that you are registered with, with a PRO. Also, with someone like PPL, we didn't talk about that, so that's neighboring rights, that's collecting your performance. So, you know, you need to claw back as much money when you're touring as possible. Also, make sure that your publisher is collecting in each territory that you're playing in. Make sure that your tour manager puts in your your um, set list into 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 each show, and make sure that it's all registered and it's with the PROs so that they will um, pay out. And that's uh, that's money from not from ticket sales. That's money just due to the writers. Is that right? That's right for the performance of of your copyrights. So that's, yeah, obviously very important to, to look into. Um, um, something else. 
<laughs> and there are all sorts of additional services um, like, I'm just going to name some, Centric and Song Trust and other broader services that people can, can use. Uh, do you recommend those, Mark? Um, you know, they're sort of competition to me, but uh, I wouldn't say that I wouldn't recommend them because, you know, maybe that's a good start, you know, as long as you can get out. And I, I know people like Centric are very good with their deals in terms of you can end it quite quickly. And I've had artists that were with Centric and they've terminated with them and they've come on to pop up. So I know that it's a, it's a good thing to do. And m my advice on that is, you know, if you're offered something, it's probably best to take it and just do it and see what happens. As long as it's not some hideous deal that's got you for life, then, you know, if it's, if it's a company that, you know, is big like Centric or someone like that, then, you know, it's probably going to be pretty sound and not too dodgy. So I would say just go for it. Probably understanding who you are and where you are in your career as well. Uh, Grace, do you, uh, do you have any advice for people developing, people who have already uh, established themselves and want to grow beyond that? What should they look out for? Well, I think it comes slightly back to the what I was mentioning before about understanding your audience and understanding who's listening to your music, but then also thinking, who do I want to listen to my music in the future? I always like doing segmentation exercises. I know that sounds a bit geeky there, but it's really simple. It's just dividing your audience into different groups based on age, um, whether they're active or passive listeners of your music. So it's defining the audience that you have, but also thinking, okay, who could be interested in my music? What playlist could I get on? You know, and I'm really sort of building a plan on, around that and understanding, okay, maybe I'm a bit more established now, so what are my next set of objectives? So I always like to think of building that 12-month vision uh, with all the goals at the end and then working out what do I have to do to get to those end goals. I think another thing which is really important that I think many bands don't take in consideration is to choose the right name of your band and project. A name that it's easy to find and not if you name your band Table, when you Google it, obviously nobody's gonna find you. <laughs> and if you look on Spotify, and also I think it's important, choose a good name that it's gonna be easy to find, and also really look after your socials because um, I think it's, it's really important not to have something that um, um, creates attention to people or get, they get interest in you. But the name of the band is super important, I think. I like Kak Marafaka. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, Very distinctive. I'm, yeah, I mean, the most important thing probably is to um, concentrate on what you're good at, to remain authentic. Don't chase any trends, just concentrate on what you're good at. Uh, and, and as they're developing, uh, we were talking about, uh, well, we were having a little chat earlier about being export ready. Uh, what does that mean? I mean, um, what can bands and individuals hope to do to make themselves more appealing as they go abroad? So this is what obviously we were jumping onto before. It's once you've established your local market and know where your targets are, in order to be export ready is building that strategic plan around it. If you get an opportunity to play, for example, at Reaper Barn, you don't just go play and go home. You really want to maximize the opportunity. So beforehand, you do your research on, can I contact any local media if I don't have a team on site? <clears throat> You also use the wonderful database of delegates that they have. You research other artists and shows that are going on. And the key is just then to be present. So I always say export ready is having a plan, definitely. Because that's the only way you're gonna be able to maximize that opportunity. And from a PR perspective, is it, uh, um, are we, when, when you're looking for, for people from other countries, what, what appeals, what, what is it about? people from other territories that attracts when 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 bands come to me to do yeah. it, yeah. i think i think um if you want to do pr in another country i think it's really important that you have a tour there that you play because making an investment in another territory that no one knows you just to do pr i think that won't work really well i think you have to at least go there and show to the audience what you do not just send a song to the radio so I think you have to have a plan, not just do PR. You have to at least do some shows. So that's, that's, I think that's important. Uh, and we're talking about... The music has to be good as well, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Of course, of course, yes. <laughs> make, make sure you learn your music. <laughs> Practice. Uh, ben? 
I mean, today it gets more and more easy to, to track where your listeners come from. Yeah. Um, that doesn't necessarily translate into ticket sales. I mean, um, you could be on 10 playlists, Spotify playlists in uh, Germany, let's say, but they're all like good morning, coffee table, whatever playlists, um, or you just, you listen to them because they, yeah, you want to have a good morning, and you just not want to listen to any specific band. Um, so that doesn't necessarily translate to ticket sales, but it's a good indication of, uh, let's say, your top three cities are in Mexico. Maybe consider to go there. Uh, we're also um, talking about building a story and a, a, a brand and, and how it... <laughs> I was just grabbing the microphone. Yeah, there. go for it. <laughs> This is because I'm very proud of my brand so much that I've had it tattooed on my arm. That is my company logo. And I think that's why you were subtly looking at me on that one. I always say when you want to start and build your own brand and build your own DNA, the best place to start is write down words. And when I say words, it's feelings, it's genres, it's what the song's about, because then it's, it's organic, then it really is you. Um, I'll give you an example. One of the artists I work with, we came up with her brand DNA, and it's vibrant and colorful soul. So I, d I didn't say, oh, she does neo soul with Afro beats, because that could be several other artists. So it's find, finding how you can be unique in your messaging. So I always say, start with the words. Write down 20 to 30 words, and you'll be amazed, because you'll have that word map and then select the top four that really resonate with you. And that's a really good tip on how to build your brand DNA. And um, a, a new artist, who could they surround themselves with? Should they uh, uh, pay a, an expensive branding agency, a designer? Who could they speak with to develop this brand? Find friends that like friends. your music, you know? That's, that's the first thing I do. I, when I start working with an artist, we just sit down for two hours with a big piece of paper and a pen, you know? And sort of I give my vision based on what I've been listening to of their music. And so I'll have a vision. So I'll create a story in my mind. <laughs> and then they'll come up with it as well. But if we're just starting out, use your friends as Definitely. a support network. Yeah, and friends and, and try to get a mentor as well. I think men, having a really good mentor is a really, really good thing. And most of us will know someone. Um, who you can reach out to, and even if they're not even in music, just to sort of give good advice in business, uh, in PR, or whatever it is. But uh, a really good, strong mentor is, 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 is invalid. And certainly from my point of view, I've, had, I've been very fortunate to have very good mentors along my way um, who have sort of shown me the path. And as Ben said earlier, you know, finding out about mistakes and where people went wrong. You know, mentors are great. It's like, yeah, I really on that bit. And, you know, you should, uh, shouldn't do that. And perhaps you should look at doing that. And uh, having a good mentor is, 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 is a good thing. Here's a question. Does the mentor need to be uh, an expert in the music industry? Where, where Not at I all. No. I mean, uh, you know, if I was to pick a mentor, I think I would pick someone in finance. I'd pick an accountant, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> You know, someone that's very good with a calculator would be uh, probably my my advice on that one. But in all seriousness, you know, lawyers, uh, doctors, you know, anyone in, at the top of their profession, you know, because if you're selling music or baked beans, it's essentially the same thing if you boil it down. You know, uh, if you're a baked bean salesman, you're just like a, you know, Ben is a, a you know, okay, baked beans don't go on tour, right? I get that, but they kind of do because they're in our supermarkets. Okay, I'm going off on one here a bit too much, but uh, you, you, you get me. Baked beans, that's what we need to know. That's a good brand. Name for a band. It's a good brand. Probably taken. Um, ben, with, with some of the, the bigger acts that you're, you're booking, um, what is it about them? I mean, obviously, they've got massive names, but um, what is it about them that, that appeals to you? And, and We're talking about state. We've got the word stadiums in, in our title how can someone who's brand new ever achieve something that, that en ends up in a stadium <laughs> uh, yeah I mean it's about taking step by step really I mean we're talking we have talked about the basics uh, so far um, I mean what would be the next steps 
get an agent, uh, get a management, get an agent, um, be present. I mean, it's all about being present on and off the stage. Um, yeah, um, perhaps they, they don't even need to really aim for stadiums. Maybe the, the most successful tools they could have could be at home with sell out uh, local club venues and things like that. Actually, Ben, I've got a question. Sorry to sort of divert, but can you go from YouTube? So, if you're really successful on YouTube, can you can you go to a stadium from from that position? I think that's possible. Yeah. Good. I, have, I, I haven't worked with an artist um, that went from YouTube to uh, stadiums. L let's take um, the Arctic Monkeys. Yes. Like Fifteen years ago, they went from YouTube to arenas, at least. Yeah, yeah, because obviously the, the sort of the classic uh, pathway would be the, uh, what we call the toilet scene in London, which is all the horrible pubs. You start in the pubs and then you work your way up. But uh, if you can avoid the toilet scene and go from, you, <laughs> from YouTube to stadium, that must be quite a nice thing, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Very cheap as well. Like we're talking about finances. There must be... Um, especially with uh, everything digital, digital now in terms of digital promotion, but also just social media, which uh, costs time and energy, I suppose, rather than money. Uh, managing that, that time maybe is, is one key aspect of it. Totally, because you do also have to take into account the, the stressful world of taking care of our mental health as well, because all of this can be so overwhelming, you know, because you do have so many things to do. You do have to be present on stories on Instagram all the time and then talking about new music and then you've got to be everywhere and this can be really stressful. So the importance is also to find the time when you have your personal time and when you are working and crafting your, your skill there. So I think that's definitely an important thing to take on board. Ben? I have a question there. What is too much? What is too little effort? This is, that's a really, really hard question actually to answer. You know, it's, are you feeling overworked? Are you feeling overwhelmed? That's probably the sign that it's getting a little too much. So you always have to try and find that time for you because we are all passionate about music. That's why we're here. We all love it, but it is our job at the end of the day. So it's finding that line between passion and profession. And Grace, I guess that goes back to the dream team because the more you can kind of delegate to different people, totally. so you, I think a good manager is is a, is a very key thing for an artist at a certain point of an artist's career that can can take the pressure off. Um, I've dealt with managers, and from my point of view, they're a real pain because they really look after the artist. So I, I see how good they can be. And particularly when you're doing, dealing with high level managers, they really, really screw down publishers and, and, and sync agents on, on fees and things. Well, speaking from like a smaller management perspective, it is tough, you know, but you've also got to listen to the artist that you're working with. I, had a, I have an example of an artist who I'm working with now and he said, Grace, I'm going to be a dad. I'm going to build a house. I don't want to go on tour. But if I don't go on tour, you're not going to earn any money. <laughs> I'm aware of that. And he was like, but I love sync. I love creating music. Can we build that into our strategy? Can that be our plan for the next two years? Creating opportunities, focusing on the world of sync. And just by having that clear direction, and we've, we've had one video game, three films and two TV adverts, just in those two years. But because we had a clear vision and, and I was understanding of his situation because we're all human beings at the end of the day. And um, uh, do you find it's important for patients with, uh, with artists, for, for artists to be patient with the managers? Yeah, respect is number one, <laughs> patience is number two. <laughs> um, we've got so much knowledge on this panel. I'm very keen to uh, have some questions from our audience. Uh, does anybody have any, any questions for our panelists? Don't be shy. There's yes. one.
Uh, I wondered about that because you spoke about you being a brand. Uh, and what are your thoughts on independent artists and being in a label? Being in a l label, did you say? Yeah. In Bulgaria, at least, we call it that. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Oh, yeah, of course we're in Bulgaria. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, who wants to take that, Mark? I think it um, depends on the label that you, you've been approached by. And, of course, a good label can do miracles. Uh, but also, you know, a small fish in a big pond, you might find that you are not getting the attention you need. So you just kind of need to look at what they can do for you. But yeah. And do your research on that label and what other artists are signed there. Speak to other artists that are signed, get their feedback. That would be the first place thing that I would do personally. And then if you find that they say pretty nice things <laughs> and it seems like a good opportunity, you know, have honest conversations saying, this is who I want to be, will you support me moving forward? Because they may say, oh no, we want you to sing in English and not the local language, and we want you to do pop, not rock, because that works better. Well, that wouldn't be the right choice of the label for you because they're not respecting the direction you want to go in. Yeah, and one point about language, actually, if, if you can sing in English and then sing in your own language, then it's always worth cutting two versions of your songs because particularly from a sync point of view, it's very useful and have your instrumentals. <laughs> Did that answer, sort of? Thank you. More questions at the back? Hi, I'll stand up so that I'm visible. Perfect. Um, I have a question uh, about how do you approach delegating tasks as a beginning artist? Because uh, I studied law, specifically entertainment law in the Netherlands, and now I'm working my way into becoming an artist. I'm studying music here. And I always found that it's a bit of a struggle to decide what do I do myself? I mean, as many upcoming artists, you have to do wear all the hats, so to speak. So what do you choose to delegate? And in that process, how do you choose to trust somebody? So I always start by doing a list. You can tell I like pen and paper, right? Um, and writing down, what am I good at? What are my strengths and what are my weaknesses? Because already that's an indicator. If you have weaknesses on social media, uh, you don't have a big address book of PR contacts, then maybe that's where you need to focus on. So I always say, start with analyzing your strengths and weaknesses. Also, delegate the things you don't like, because then you can concentrate on the things you do like, and that will give you more energy. Absolutely. I found out that I love producing, performing live mix, and but not mixing, mastering, and marketing. So, <laughs> Well, that's an interesting thing, the mixing and the mastering. That's probably a wise decision to actually give it to someone else, because yeah. then you get that other perspective. I mean, you know, this is not a mixing and mastering class, but I do know a little bit about that. And I think always having that uh, extra pair of ears on your music can, can add something to it. Breaking it down into stages, I guess. And we're talking about mixing, mastering, of course, that's something that you do before you start releasing your music and sharing it. Um, Anita, do you, uh, do you get sent music a lot? Sorry, second? Do you get sent music a lot? Uh, sing music. Uh, just music in general for listening. Oh, sorry. Mi yes, I receive lots of emails from bands, yes, definitely. So, um, so what was the question then? Ah, yes, <laughs> uh, in terms of ears and perspective, uh, it, do, you, do you have people sending you demos? and? and no, basically, normally people send me or just to introduce themselves the music they already have recorded or the, the next things that they're gonna, they would like to, to show to the, to the audience. But yes, I get a lot, actually. So um, he's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the big amount of emails receiving is... So the thing is that if I'm someone who listens to bands, I cannot imagine the amount of emails that the press receive or you all receive. So it's, um, it's pretty overwhelming, actually. Yeah. And there's probably a financial consideration. You know, once you're interested in something, they have to um, consider the, the cost of taking that a little bit further. And maybe that's perhaps a little bit to do with what you're asking as well in terms of un understanding what to, what to look for next. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. At the back. Hi. Um, and thank you guys for speaking uh, today. I'm Lisa. Um, I would just love to hear your guys' perspective as an artist myself on, you know, in an age of social media where songs can become 
viral pretty much in a heartbeat just on, you know, organic or just like virality. How do you think the role of labels have changed in promoting artists when artists are doing a lot of their own promotion before they get in the door? Yeah, um, firstly, it's fantastic. It's a, it's a massive help. Um, from a sync perspective or from, from, from what you know, Mark? Sometimes uh, a music supervisor might say, what are the stats on this artist? Because this needs to be, this is a brand thing. So we're looking at uh, a product which needs a f to get some extra um, uh, traffic to their product. So sometimes with, with uh, good stats, it comes in. But in the main, in sync, it's not about stats. It's about a good song. And it's about a song that will be good for the sync and, and the project. Does that uh, answer your question a bit? Um, yeah, I was mostly speaking in a sense of like, as like people who are sort of, you know, booking tours and doing all that sort of thing, um, like how, how do I put this? Oh my God, my words. Um, so, you know, when artists are doing a lot of their own work in cultivating an audience, um, how has the role of like your guys' roles changed in a social media age is more so what I'm asking. Like and do you, uh, you look at social media stats when you're, you're booking artists? Absolutely. I mean, it's still nice to have an album campaign. Have the album out, go on tour a month or two, two months later, have all the, the, the media, have all the promo. But it's not important that much anymore because you can sell out a tour without any album at all, with two songs out maybe only. So that uh, definitely has a... a, a a huge, huge effect. So have you found it's opened up doors a little bit more to those who haven't had maybe more traditional PR in the past? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as I said before, um, if you, you're good on, on social media, if you're authentic, um, if you create an atmosphere, um, that's the best, um, best promo you can do. I think also just to jump on, on your question, uh, sort of about how have our roles evolved, I think from all of our perspectives, you've always got to be aware of what are the latest trends, you know, what's happening, what's the focus, you know, if all of a sudden, for example, in the DSP and playlist space, you have more opportunities than ever to pitch actually your own music now, but you've got to be constantly learning all these things, you know, and know how to pitch your music on Apple Music, on Spotify, update your profiles on Tidal, on Apple Music. So I'd say our job is obviously evolved along with the trends in the industry and just keeping an eye on everything that's going on. Because if we're supporting an artist in their career, we've got to know what's actually going on in the music world. Um, and I suppose um, there's a bit more pressure on, on artists to have achieved that on their own. Uh, have done the work for, for socials. Uh, when you're looking from a PR perspective, are you looking at their profiles and thinking, have they done that? Have they done that work themselves? Yes, yes, definitely. And also, I was thinking that um, I remember when I started um, working as a PR, uh, there was no internet. There was the only the only way to learn to hear music was the radio or TV. And now, I mean. The other day there was an article in a Spanish newspaper that said every day they are released, I think it's 190,000 songs a day. That's, that's impossible, nobody can hear all this music. <laughs> so, and also before, um, the only way to be heard was uh, to be on a record label, and now not anymore. So that's, in one way it's really good because now you don't need to have that to be on the market, but at the same time, everybody can do that. So there's too many bands. So, and, and now not only do you have to uh, record songs, make songs and play, you also have to look after the socials. So now it's more, it's harder for the artists now and it's harder for all of us and even for the audience because it's impossible to listen all the projects and bands that there are these days. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, lots of competition. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Uh, at the front. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, what type of content is good to post on social media? 
in order to create a good brand for yourself as an artist. Any social media buffs on this panel? I mean, I'm no expert by any stretch, but I just think something that reflects yourself and makes you individual and, and is, yeah, be you, exactly. And uh, that uh, reflects what you're all about. And, and is it interesting and exciting? And, and share what you want to share as a person. You know, you don't have to feel obliged to be on every social media because everybody's on it. You've got to find what works for you as a person and how can you be organic? Because that's the best way you're going to reach your, your audience is being you in your posts. It's creating, you know, real pictures, uh, video content. It's, it's finding that nice balance between what you're showing. Yeah, and also yeah, point it towards where you want to be. So if you want to get into uh, live touring, you know, then Ben might have a social media channel. So then you point yourself to maybe that he might actually see something that you're doing or, or what I'm doing in, in sync. So if you're looking at sync or, or, or what Sam's doing in sync, then you, know, you can f have a smaller audience. You don't have to have millions of followers, but if you're very targeted with your, with your social media in who you want to attract and commenting on, say, Sam's and Ben's and Grace's pages, then, then you stand more of a chance of, of actually getting where, to where you want to be. I mean, sorry, sorry, Ben, please go ahead. It's, it sounds odd, but still, I think the most important thing is to be authentic, not to chase for anything, and to be clever. I had a band playing last night in, in Germany who posted on Instagram while they were on stage. So uh, be clever, don't do that. <laughs> um, I think also uh, find people who you like who are similar to you uh, at the similar stage in their career or maybe just a little bit above, a little bit beyond, maybe a few months down the line or half a year down the line and see what they did it, as long as you're comfortable with it. And I think be consistent. So, uh, you know, a, a post every few days is okay, uh, a quick story. Um, there's no need to, to chuck a whole load of content down at once. And I think the, another important thing is also be seamless in your communication because if you're using a particular photo or your one line DNA on Instagram, then make sure you use that same photo on your Spotify, on your Facebook. The, the amount of times as well people forget to update information. I mean, I've seen, I had a band that was terrible on Instagram and one year later they said, new album out now and it was released six months ago and I'm like, you know, there's, there's things that just, you need to take care and keep things updated. One thing uh, that I, I um, stuck with me, I went to the Future Music Forum in about 2016, and there was a guy doing a talk on social media, and he, he said that if, uh, if content is the king, then the queen is distribution of that content, and she wears the trousers. And I just remember him saying that, and I think that's very true is how you distribute that content and capitalize on it and, and put it in the right places and just change it up a little bit and, and so it's, on. It's all about even building that story with a release. So imagine you're gonna release a single next month. So the best thing to do is plan week by week. What, what can I tell people about that song? What do I wanna share? Do I wanna tell people what it's about? Do I want them to hear a little snippet of it? Do they want to see the, the making of the song? You know, it's you'd be surprised about how much content you can make out of just one element. And I always say, build the post release into that story and into that plan as well, you know? So make sure you do four weeks before, three to four weeks after, and you'll be surprised on what stories you can tell around that. And treat it like work. Treat it a little bit like work, you know, set aside time each day or every few days and uh, plan it out and, and treat it professionally, I think. Thank you. I think there's another question over here. I think we have maybe time for, for one more question. Um, I guess it's mostly a, a PR question. For international acts who are already touring and do have PR in certain markets, are there any specific considerations they should be keeping in mind for the Spanish market? About the Spanish market? Yes. Um, basically, as I said, it's just try to... Um, to meet the right people, basically, and I think it's important that um, you should um, go to these music fairs or conferences, and also observe the bands that are similar to your style or, or the bands that you admire. 
how they did in that country and just a bit follow a bit the steps. That's what also Sam said, no? that be an observer and not, not to copy, but basically just to learn how, how to get into that. And also research the different medias that are in that territory. Like for example, in Spain, Radio 3 is a real tastemaker radio. So if you get airplay on that, it's a good sign. You know, or if you have an article in Mondo Sonoro, which is one of the biggest music uh, media, then that's already another good sign. So it's take time, do your research about who are the key players in whatever market that you're going to do PR in. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think that's just about it. Uh, quick poll from the audience. Um, who's learned something from today? Quick show of hands. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, that's what we want to see. <laughs> Validation. Thank you. Um, thanks to our panelists, Ben, Grace, Anita, Mark. Thank you, everyone. And if, if you want to know more about Sync, Mark's going to run over to the next room. Right yes, now, please so run over to the other room if you want to. I don't know more. if he's going to talk about baked beans, though. Hopefully not. <laughs> it might make me hungry.